glad you take your Bibles and join with me in 1 Timothy, the third chapter. We're looking at verses 1 through 7 in detail. Every one of these qualifications are necessary for men to have before they are going to serve as elders. So God has given us a plan to follow. You put all of Titus and Timothy together and look at all the translations. There's 29 characteristics of a man that qualify him for an elder. And we're looking, we've got down to the midst of it. We talked about in number J, the temper's justice with mercy. That's gentleness. You're, you're not unjust, but you're merciful. And therefore you will be gentle with the person, with the situation. You'll think through that, uh, always seeking the well-being of another person. Where have they been to get to that point? Do you just overlook that and say, here's the, well, here's the law, it's what it's going to do? Or do you have the meekness of character where you will look at it from their standpoint and keep your mouth shut if something is going to uh, harm more than help? At the same time, speak the things that are, are just, but there's mercy connected with that. And there's a lot of difference. Well, I know the truth and I'm an elder and this is what you're going to do. Another way of understanding where that person is coming from and mixing justice with mercy. There's your gentle person. It always will be. He's not being soft. He's not going to ignore the truth. He's not going to be wishy-washy and say, well, we'll just be, we'll be gentle and we'll be merciful. When reality is there may be something that needs to be a said and done that is God's way that is also being merciful even if it means pouring out sins so you can forgive them that's merciful that's being merciful that your sins can be forgiven so that's a quality and you wonder why a man is an elder sometimes you have to have life experiences to be able to get to that point in your life where you would even qualify we've already talked about not being someone newly planted, a new convert, this is one of the reasons uh, where that is happening. So we're looking more than, oh, that's, he's had a good disposition, he's a, he's a meek and gentle man, I think he'll be an elder. Mercy and justice coming together at the right time, in the right place, in the right manner, that's what we're looking at. And you say, well, that was, he has a lot of tact. Well, because he's gentle. He's a, uh, He's full of mercy and justice. And that's a, a quality. That doesn't mean we're always perfect in that, or man is. But it is that uh, uh, point that we, we talked about last time. Any questions on uh, that before we get to this one? <laughs> we start to, this morning with uh, K. And it's a manifest, a love of strangers. So there's the definition. What word or phrase do you have that uh, would uh, fit that Definition. Hospitality. Hospital. Hospitality. And yet we sometimes don't think of that as being a love of strangers. But you look at the Greek word, phileo, love, and then there's the stranger. So what? Put us, let's go back to the time in which uh, we looked at Did they even have a Motel 6? You know, they had an inn. Uh, the, the Good Samaritan put him in the inn. And they were kind of a hospital. <laughs> they were able to take care of his, uh, the needs and keep him healthy while uh, he was gone. But a lot of times people would be called upon to open their homes so they could be hospitable. They can welcome strangers because people would be traveling. And a lot of times a, a love of strangers would involve brethren that are traveling great distances and they would open their homes to, to them. And one of the things that will go to hell for in Matthew 25 is that I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. You didn't see to my need. I, I am a brother in Christ in this context of Matthew 25 and you, you did not help me. So well, today, most of the time people traveling, they've already made their arrangements at not Motel 6, but they've got a, got a Hampton down here. They've got other places they want to go. Are you taking care of that? What about lunch? Are you taking care of that? We've got to be on the road. We've got to be going here. Uh, 
we're, we live in different times. But there is a sense, the necessary point of, of hospitality where you open your home to even uh, strangers or people who have just moved in the community. They don't know anybody. Here's where we have visitors come our way. We look, we see to their needs, ask them what their plans are. They need, they need help. As individuals, we can be hospitable to people and we sometimes have to use our, our good judgment. A lot of times people are bumming off churches and so when that happens to a preacher, I don't want the church to be involved, you take care of them by yourself and you'll find them a motel. Uh, that's a personal responsibility and yet there's sometimes when I do and sometimes when I don't because I know the situation. I kind of know where they're coming from. They indicate that. But there are other times I ask no questions and we, we, we just take care of them and we, other people do that here too as individuals. But that's a, you're going to have to make a judgment call. But in this particular context, a lot of it was welcoming people that come from a distance that are, that are Christians. We, we, will, we will be hospitable to angels unaware in Hebrews. Well, angels? Messengers sent by God on a mission? Uh, that's what was happening in the first century and, and uh, you, might, you might have had that experience in your life. Not, not that they're running with wings and they, they have wings and they, they flying around. It's maybe people on a mission. Angels sent, messengers sent. Uh, God working out his providential care. And if we don't welcome strangers, we may miss out on an angel, a one who was sent to help maybe our particular need that day. And so there's the openness. There's the concern. Well, who takes that lead in a congregation? It's those who, they're hospitable people. They, they, they're always welcoming strangers or somebody that's traveling through. And most of the times, that's not needed today because of affluence and because of the way we travel. And uh, we don't wash feet today because people don't have dirty feet because they're not wearing sandals and walking on the road out here. But we could do that. I've done that with, with brethren when they're, they're sick and, and in hospitals. And you'll be willing to do it. There's the meekness. There's the humility. That's connected with a slave in the first century times. But it's uh, what women did. They were going to be taken care of by the church as part of their good works in that particular time. So we have to translate it into our time. A lot of times that opportunity is not given. Sometimes it's too dangerous to, to do that. No one's questioning your judgment. But when brethren are traveling and they come place, I'll tell you what impresses them because I've had this happen. I've gotten letters from people who said the church was very kind. Thank you for your hospitality. They, they appreciate that. I've never had a, a thank you letter from a person I thought was taking advantage of the church. Never have. That may not have been, but never have gotten a thank you note or a thank you card. Uh, th that's just people using churches. That's a reality too. And they'll use the Good Samaritan. I had a lady do that, bring, brings her daughter. She's, right, she's had a better car than I had, but she drove up and her daughter kind of revealed things. She said, Mommy, does this mean we're not going to get a bicycle? And uh, she took her and went off. But she used the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan didn't want references. That's what I was asking for at that time. Usually that kept the people from wanting to help because they didn't want to fill out the questionnaire. Have you been arrested? Have you been in jail before? Uh, do you have people that could test for your character? They don't want to fool with that. They want to hand out and out the door. So that eliminated a lot of people like that. But she fought back. But her daughter talk about what to get a new bicycle. It wasn't food on the table. It wasn't a, a water to drink. It wasn't anything like that. It was a new bicycle. And that's the world that we live in too. I think I need to be wise as a serpent and uh, cunning if I have to be to find out what's, what, is that, uh, what is that person coming from. To, to, I'm not going to give my money to bums that... Uh, not willing to work and that sort of thing. You've all had, you've held, had to deal with that. But the, one of the qualifications is that here you have this love of strangers. That just because they're a stranger and you don't know them doesn't mean you're not going to invite them to take care of whatever they need because they're traveling. They're, they're not at home. Any, any questions on, on that? And that must be manifested. So when do you start doing that? When you're a young couple and you've got a lot of energy? That's probably when you need to start 
doing that because that's what a congregation will look at when uh, as you get older not greedy we speak about not greedy this is where translations are going to be a little different sometimes uh, we won't think in terms but I'm going to bring both of them <coughs> to to our account because I've, I've given two definitions not greedy and then the M is you might as well get that one out there the M is not inclined to shameful profit making that would kind of involved money too would not it so what did you put for not greedy and some of it will be, <coughs> your word will be what would just necessarily, not greedy would be, what's the synonym for that? Or what's, a, what's the word that would be defined as that? And you have in your Bibles, not covetous, not greedy for gain. Not necessarily shameful profit make it, but greedy for, uh, for gain because my, my version, I will put uh, no lover of money. There's the covetous person. But some of the translations have that. And then also you have that, is that not inclined for shameful profit making, my say, not, not lover of filthy lucre. <laughs> filthy lucre. Or it's not filthy liquor. No, it's lucre. It's shameful profit. It's not necessarily money, but that's in part of it. But you'll have that. So you'll have the word uh, greedy in, in some of the context there. But both those are found in verse 3 in, in, my, in my text that I'm coming from. So profit making, I don't, I don't have a love of money that would lead me, how can I make a profit here that will not be right? Because money's controlling me, so any way I can make a profit, I will do that. I'll sell that person a car and we'll give him all the details about it because I want to make a profit. And I won't if I'd have to tell him all the things that's wrong with it. So I'll just shade that. No, you're not that kind of person. You're the kind of person that will just spill your guts. And the guy said, I don't think I want that car. Okay, I'll give it to my kids down the road. But there's the sense of, of being up, up front with people, and it's not because I want to make a buck. And a lot of times, who are going to be your elders? They're going to be the men who have made uh, a, a profit in their life, and they have a lot of money, and they're going to be good leaders. That's the way a lot of people think. But not necessarily so. Maybe that's what controls them. And you put them in a place of spiritual leadership, you might be asking for trouble. And this is way of guarding that. How do they, how do they react to, to my, are they a covetous person always wanting more and more and more and more and more in life? And more uh, physical things? Are they satisfied with what they have? And realize that here is the idea of, of my needs are taken care of and I am content with what I have? Oh, I could have more. I might want to study to have a, a better life. And there's nothing wrong with that. But at the moment of time, I I'm, I'm, ought, ought to be content. And where I am because of the blessing, I do have cover over my head tonight. Food's not exactly what I wanted. And it's not the t situation I wanted. Uh, but, uh, you know, you're taking care of my needs, God. I am rising up for the occasion. And I am content with the situation I have right now. And when you have a person like that, money is not going to be something that influences them to do something that would be unlawful. A fil filthy lucre. And uh, that's how I uh, divide those. Any, any comments you want to have with that, with, with the idea of money? All right. So there's the profit making. A gentleman in conduct and appearance. Well, I never thought we were going to judge by appearance. But sometimes appearance reveals the heart. And your elders are going to have to manifest that. Your future elders need to have that. So what is a gentleman in conduct and appearance? You find any word that uh, fits that in your Bible? Well, I've already given that one. <laughs> But you're, they all fit. They're, they're not going to contradict one another. But there's, there's, there's one in all of our... All right, let me give you the Greek word, okay? It's where we get our word cosmos. Cosmos. What is cosmos in Greek? And modest apparel. It's 
It's got modest, Greek word cosmos, root for the head. What is about modest and the cosmos that would be a gentleman in conduct and appearance? That's all I'm going to give you. And there's only one word that will fit that. And your translation will give you another word. And I will accept that one. Did any of you have respectable? A lot of versions do. What about, Shirley? Okay, see, you shook your head. That's right, it's, it's true. Respectable. And then my faithful American standard version says orderly. The cosmos, orderly. When you see modest apparel, well arranged for the occasion, orderly. That, they, they have that, they come about that in their conduct, and it's seen in their appearance as well. Where you can see, that's, there's a gentleman for you. He's older, but there's a gentleman. There's an orderness about him that's respectable that's well arranged and stands out in his conduct and his appearance. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. I think that would be good behavior. Uh, but there's that, that would be an orderly behavior. Oh, and so if you just think of that Greek word, and orderly, you can fit in either, any, all of those. But it means well-ordered life. He's not crazy. Not a crazy old man. Not doing crazy things. Uh, he's, he's orderly. And it, there, there's a dignity. You might have a dignity in that. We'll see that the, the word grave uh, indicates that. We've already talked about. But there's a dignity about the person. And... Regardless of what age they're in, that's what you begin to see in that person. That, that is just as much importance than being hospitable. And all these other ones, when you, the, these are something to rise to, but when does one start thinking about that in their life? Shouldn't we all be orderly in our life? After all, we only have one master, don't we? After all, we only have one destination that's, that's essential to us, don't we? And all the things that go in life, the center, it, we don't say, I got a little pie here, and that's going to my service for God, and then I got another pie here, there's my recreation, there's another pie here, there's my work. No, the whole center is God. And you've got an orderly mind, because you've already got your hope set in heaven. You know how to get there is following the Lord. And you are patterning your life after the Lord. As I said before, I know we talked about a, a Muslim who converted to Protestantism. I think he missed it. He became a Catholic. But the reason he did that said this is a lot easier. <laughs> because uh, it tells me where I'm, the, the, the basis for what I'm going for. And he didn't get that from Muslim. He just got people telling him what to do. And you had to do this. You had to do that. But God gives us the whole picture of why we do things. And it's reflected in our leadership in a local congregation. It even comes down to that personal lives and then leadership in local congregation. Here's your personal lives. And we need men. And I think, I would think wives would like a gentleman for a husband. You want a slob? One that's not orderly in his life? He's, wait, he, this fellow probably picks up after himself. It's cosmos. It's, it's an orderly life, and it's a loving, caring for others life. It's, it's, he's gentle, and all of those things, but he's strong as a rock. He's going to be stable as a rock, but there's these other qualities that, that maybe soften that rock into a lively person that is godly. Because whatever God wants me to be, that's what I'm going to be. Well, what Christian wouldn't want to do this? And we'll talk about that in a moment. Any a gentleman in conduct and appearance. That's kind of one of the best, good behavior, uh, respectable. Because what, what would cause us to have respect a person like that? Money? That may be, no, he, that, that may be his life and what he's looking for in life. 
But there's that, there's that godly character that is coming up. Any, any questions on that? All right. After that, I've, we got a few questions because in my life, when we start choosing elders, the problem is always going to be entering into the family. It seems like it's always there. These other ones, maybe they, they just accept that. He's not a bully and uh, he's a godly person. He can teach a Bible class and uh, he's, he's a pretty good guy. And, and maybe you, you go through and check out for all, all of these. Maybe that is important to you. But what becomes really important and where people have the most uh, conflict with, with churches determining who's going to be their elders, will deal with the qualifications connected with the family. And that's important, too. But all of a sudden with the family, we've got relationships. It's not just the person. I'm orderly. I'm a gentleman. All these things. It's how, how uh, what about your children? Now, it's interesting Timothy doesn't give you the qualities of children. Titus does. So we're not studying that side of it. What did we see about, uh, about the, uh, anything connected with children? They have, their father presents a seriousness and they, they're, subject, they're subjected to their father in all gravity. Seriousness respect, adoration. It's out of respect, not fear, not a phobia. He's got, he's got the belt. He's, got, he's stronger than I am, and he's mean and all those things, but we, we told the line around our house. He's not a dictator. That's not a good elder. Get a diatrophies when that happens. But they respect him and their subjection to him, and we see that in the wife. We see that in the children. That's why his household's that way. But you're, you're having, what's your influence on other people that brings about, they will submit to your leadership in the home. Your wife will and your children. They do it out of respect. That's all Timothy talks about. And so I want us to look at, first of all, the, the qualifications here of, does the qualification of bishops also apply as qualifications of the faithful Christian? And if there are exceptions... Tell me. Uh, we're not looking at all 29 because there's children involved. But right here, let's, let's say, for argument's sake, there are some qualities that I can be a Christian but not an elder yet. What would those be? Okay. And that, is that important today? How many churches of Christ today call themselves still churches of Christ, they have women elders. It's amazing. What did they overlook? A one woman type of man. Well, can they be lesbians? I hope not, <laughs> but I just love one woman. One woman type of man is that he's the husband of one wife. Not a polygamist. Doesn't have a bunch of concubines. And could have, in cases, put away his wife for a scriptural reason and remarried, and he still has one wife. He's not bound to another one. So you, you could look through those things of uh, equality, but the marital status, uh, and there's, a, the, I guess, the sexual status, and I, that's a good thing to bring up. Can a woman be an elder of a local church? What are you going to have to overlook? She's not the husband of one wife. And, and our gender things, I, I, we had a couple here that was visiting, and we had some interaction with him. He was changing his sex to a woman, and he had gotten pretty far along with the hormone treatment, so he comes to visit us. So we're seeing this big person that's a woman, trying to be a woman. And in visiting them in their home, they said, we're, we're members of the church, and, and he wants to be, do this way. And I just I said, well, how are you going to, what's your relationship with him going to be? And she said, well, he's always going to be my husband. I said, you want him to be changed completely over to a woman. You're going to be sleeping with a woman. Is that okay with you and God? And she never thought about that. Because see, in her mind, that will still be my husband. He just wants to change. It makes no difference. How God made us. 
We get people, it's just going to be, it's happiness because he hates being a male. That's it. He thought he was too male-ish. He hated maleness. And so I don't like that. I'm going to change to that. That's what people are doing. And they may find out that wasn't so bad. But God has said, you still, if you're going to be a woman, you can't be an elder. And a woman who was born that way can't be an elder too. And there's that leadership role. And that's where the modern religious thought today is, that is so archaic. And we got young women here, they're, being, they're going to colleges, universities, our society. We even hate to think about, well, we were that exclusive that a woman, she has a lot of talent and she can't, look at all the women she could help. And let's, we, we'll rationalize it. We'll make, we'll make her an elder. Only for six months because we have a turnover in our church. That's what a lot of modern church, you know, they, they don't want to get burned out. So they change over every six months or a year. And maybe they'll come back a little bit later. But the idea of a woman being an elder is so archaic to say no. But I, we say no because the Bible teaches that. There's that leadership role of, of the, the man over the woman. And God has made that real clear, especially a husband over a wife. And we've seen how wonderful that works together with God's plan. And the test is, will we have faith in God to order our lives after that? And I hope our, our young women do that too. What about being single? Would we, would we all agree that uh, a single male who never found his wife in life at this time, uh, could be an elder, why, why would you keep him from doing that? Because he's got to be the husband of one wife. Because what's going to happen, the third one, to have family. Can a man who's married and has no children, no children, would they be qualified? They sure could be, they could be a Christian, can't they? And then what about a novice? Novice in my Bible is, is newly planted. One who has been buried with Christ just recently, raised to walk in the newness of life. That, uh, can that person, I mean, we, we, and the point is no, and we're asking for trouble, because we'll be one that's ready for the condemnation of the devil. The pride issue, I think, is forefront in that qualification. All of a sudden, I'm a leader in a congregation, and I've only been a Christian just for a you know, few months or a year. And... Uh, I must be pretty special. They all wanted me. They can go to your head. And it's not the, the character that's formed by living each day as we've been looking at it in, in detail. So those four, I had three. You added the sexual thing. Uh, that's what we have to go to there. Any other qualification? Now, if a woman, you know, we, I, I got off track and went to change gender and all that, but a woman born a woman, uh, she can't be there. You got to be married, got to have children, and can't be a new convert. The rest of them is what a Christian ought to be. That's what we all, male or female, we should be striving to put those qualities. So if we are, we are doing our work as a local church that we're all at different stages in life, but we always have young men and young women. Hopefully we'll always continue to have that part of our, our congregation. That, that's, when, that's when you young men need to be focusing on your character. And it'd be good for you to not win. Well, hey, we're going to have to pick elders here next week. Uh, well, last week, Jerry, won't you preach on it? And we'll, we'll preach on it. But you need to be said, this is what I need to be as a man. And the characteristics of that apply to, to a woman as well. And those are the only exceptions I have that of one, keeping one from being out. Any, any comments or questions that we want to ask that? But there are deals with the family issue there. Yes, sir. No, and that's not a sin to not have desire for that. That's a good point. That's a good point. You might want to serve in other ways, and uh, um, thank you.
That, that's another reason we could be a Christian and not that. All right, question two. Who cannot serve as an overseer because the qualifications must be the husband of one wife? I kind of gave my little detail. You might speak it differently. But I must be the husband of one wife. So that would eliminate polygamist, right? What about the, the concubines? During, the, during these times, you had uh, women on the side uh, that they had... Uh, He's not a one-woman type of man. <laughs> so they had concubines. I think it was I indicating uh, that. What about a person unlawfully divorced and is remarried? And they come along. And I'm a husband of one wife. I'm not a polygamist. We got a, the other one, got, we got a divorce. And yes, that's true. You may have divorced, but you're still bound by law, Romans 7, to what? What mate? The first mate. Now, law is the land. You're probably not going to be a polygamist because you got divorce papers on that. But you were not divorced for the right reason. And either you divorced for the wrong reason or you were divorced for the wrong reason. Well, as a Christian, you can't, or anybody else, you don't have a right to even remarry, but you did. And you may come along and say, I've been, I've been, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm qualified. And people don't ask any questions. Their churches won't ask any questions like that. What do what our elders do? We, I know for a fact they ask about their past marital situation. We don't know them. And I know also I get, I get calls from people that they were so incensed because the elders asked them those questions and they don't ever want to go back to that church. Well, how are people going to know today? We had a young couple in their 20s that we baptized. I, I, I taught them and baptized and never thought about asking had been married before. They were in their early 20s. I didn't even think about it. But when we started studying to ground them, that's when we found out about it. And what's sad, ended up having to withdraw from them. Yeah, the same young couple that saw the truth and wanted to obey the gospel. But they began looking for a church that would accept their marriage. And they found one. And I think their souls are still, still in jeopardy. But it saddens me. But it's, it's wise to ask. And if the people don't like it, they need to understand. And I hope you, if you go be a member somewhere else and they ask you that, that's, that's a good thing to do. Because uh, they might help us to get, get right with God regarding the marriage situation. But that person, even though they're right now a one woman type of man, I'm only married to one woman. Uh, unlawful marriage and uh, divorce and, and remarriage would, would probably would li eliminate that. And, but you have to ask questions. All right. We don't have that question up here. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, yeah, let's, let's deal with that one. He loses his wife. Has he always been a one-woman type of man? I'm going to, I'm going to give it to you where, where some would go. And because we'll sure do that with the kids. Were they faithful when they were under his roof? Yeah, that's when he's qualified. But now here's a man that was qualified at one time for that. But now currently... Let's say he's, let's say he has not been serving as an elder. Would he be the husband of one wife at this particular time? And what would you probably say? No. Well, he has been. Well, I know, but you've never served as an elder. If you wanted to consider that, you never one time were, were, were authorized. I mean, you were never uh, uh, qualified. But here, this is kind of a simple point. You're not one. And you're not the husband of one wife. I've always been the husband of one wife, but you're not married any longer. And we, we got Bible for that. And you're not going to be married in heaven either. We know that. So that might be a reason why you know, I think you're a good man. But he may, but I worry about if he starts dating people. <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> he may be picking the wrong, wrong one just to get qualified. But the point is, is that at that particular time, uh, I think he would understand you are not presently that we can look at the husband of one wife. Even though we knew his wife, we knew their marriage before, but now he's at a particular age, he's maybe a young widow-er, and that situation might come. But I think we could, we did. But what about the person who has been serving as an elder, is continuing to serve as an elder, and his wife just died? That's where disagreement comes. That's where uh, judgment of understanding, judgment as far as we understanding our, our scriptures. But let's look at it from a practical standpoint. Well, I'm not going to make you resign. But here are things to consider. How would that help him in the hospitality area? Would that be something that's going to change a little bit? I mean, there's some, I guess there's some husbands that uh, do all that hospitality stuff, but I know in most homes that's, that's kind of what the wife does. And I know for a fact when I, I went to a meeting and, and the gentleman had, uh, he was preaching, but he had had to divorce his wife for years and never remarried, so he's an older gentleman. And we're going to have potluck, and we're going to have it in the preacher's house. Because, see, he lived in the preacher's house. And so hospitality is going to come in his house. But he didn't cook a thing. <laughs> Who did? The women did. And they just took over. And I watched it. And he just had to sit back and enjoy it. And they cleaned the dishes. And they, kept, they, they cleaned up the house. And it's back to us two bachelors for the week. And I realized that would be a, a difficult thing. To rise up to be hospitable, you might want to back off that if, if, if he is going through that. So some of those qualifications would be would be hampered. If someone comes in and they don't know, but he, he's been a he's been a strong elder. Well, you've never seen it. You've never seen that interaction with his family and his wife. So there's some areas where that might be a concern. And but does it automatically mean they have to? Uh, step down and my, my thought is is he now a husband of one wife currently and it's hard to say yes it's hard to say yes and it might be that he, he uh, might need to step down yes And it's all present tense, isn't it? <laughs> That's a good point. It's because that was out of my control. <laughs> but sometimes there are other situations are too that we don't qualify. I didn't find a wife, didn't find a husband, that sort of thing. It's a good point. Yes, sir? That's why he need a bunch of children. <laughs> I thought about it, all of them wiped out in one track or something. Yeah. Really? I don't, I don't. I guess I hope he'd have one more <laughs> that would respect her daddy, and uh, so that that's my little point about. But that's a, that's a good point. That hasn't continued. That stopped. Yes, sir.
No. I don't read here where a man knows everything a woman thinks. I don't find that qualification there. Or <laughs> figure out what, where is she coming from. <laughs> That's, you, there's experience there, but then all of a sudden you miss it. And have that taken away, that's a, that's a good point. I'm, I'm you know, I, I think I know Kathy pretty well, but sometimes you're calling and you, uh, you didn't mean to call that person. Sitting in, sad to be on the, the only, and you hit it and all of a sudden you call, and, oh no, I need, and you hang up. Well, I got a call from Kathy that way. She, nev she never before did that, but, but I didn't call back. And that was a mistake. I thought, I have that up all the time. I don't want to have to call them and say, wait, I didn't mean to call you, Jerry. I thought that was happening. But that day, uh, it upset her. Why didn't you call me back? You know, and she's, she's easy to live with. But I realized I'm thinking in terms what I think is wise and, and not going to put her on the spot. I missed it that day. I never figure out completely. And you married over 50 years, so that's, uh, you keep learning. But to have that taken away, I know my hospitality, uh, you, you wouldn't want my hospitality right now. I, I wouldn't know how to fix you anything other than scrambled eggs and bacon. That's it. But I, that's a good point about the help me situation. That's taken away. And uh, currently, that would be the situation they're not in. And I think those are good, good points. Oh, excuse me. Or you like this one. Do apostate children who are grown and maintain their own household disqualify their father serving as an elder? And that becomes a big issue. Our, our times, the world has taken children. And from godly homes, it has. And so would that qualify them? And here we got believing children over in Titus. And I know our time is short, but we just may put this out here. What I want us to think about, here's a, here's a quality that was determined when you had young children. I have, we have had an elder here that said you're not qualified until those kids leave the home and, and uh, then if they're faithful, then the person's qualified. I don't read that here. That the children, that's why under the roof, uh, I don't have... I, my son has now created his own family. And he's, he's either going to qualify or disqualify himself as being elder. But the point is, is that we're under the, the roof where, where they, they serve with, with gravity and respect for their dad and so forth. A lot of times in families that happens. And... That's when you can look at You have to wait till they're 40 and out of the house or 30 out of the house. Now we can determine that. Sometimes you may have apostate children uh, already. And that may come to f reflect upon how do you raise them when you're, you're coming up to be considered as an elder. But can we look at men whose kids are not out of, out of the roof, you know, under authority of the roof? Uh, because once, a, once one leaves the house and then marries, they got their own family. And they're, they're qualifying themselves for the future. But does that reflect upon it? it? It may reflect upon that, and we'll talk about that more in detail. But that's the point. Can you look at a one that has teenagers? That man's qualified. Or do you have to wait till they get married and have their own home? Or, or just stay single in their own home? And that's, that's where we're going to have to go. Uh, if we can't, we've got to wait till that time. And we'll... we'll We'll talk about that, Laura, next time. Thank you.